Good evening. My name is Brian McDonnell. I am Programme Manager and Producer at Sirius Arts Centre. I'd like to welcome you to this online event um, that's in association with National Heritage Week. The project you'll be hearing about has been kindly supported by the Community Heritage Grant Scheme run by the Heritage Council. As many of you will know, um, Sirius Arts Centre is located in a building that served as the headquarters and club for the Royal Cork Yacht Club um, from 1854 when the building was built until 1966 when the club moved back to, across the harbour to Cross Haven. The building is of architectural significance and it has its own historical and cultural legacy. We believe it's important to gain um, full and comprehensive understanding of this heritage asset to gain support for its care and preservation, as well as to increase advocacy through engagement with the community. The project you'll hear about um, this evening is just one of a number of planned steps to create a narrative about the building towards future initiatives and programs. Sirius has been celebrating the heritage of the building um, and the wider context of the historic town of Cove and Cork Harbour for many years now. In addition to our contemporary art offerings, we've had several exhibitions with heritage themes, um, including Spike Island People in Place, um, and more recently the exhibition you see here, the Royal Cork Yacht Club, uh, 1854 to 1966, which focused on um, the period where uh, where the yacht club was based in the building. Um, I won't go into the content ex exhibition in any great detail. I hope some of you got to see it. Um, this is just two items um, that were given on loan um, for the exhibition. The one on the left is a wages book from 1901, 1902 to 1910 that was given on loan to us by the Royal uh, Cork Yacht Club. And on the right, you see um, an address to Richard Smith Barry dating to 1890, which was lent to us by uh, David Burke, who was uh, his descendant. Um, the exhibition um, was really brought the, the building to life for visitors and, and the serious team. Um, and it also um, finally got me the opportunity to dig out the architectural drawings, which were carefully stored in a board member's house. And um, I got some provisional digital images and displayed them on the TV screen, as you see here. Um, but I suppose it raised lots of questions about um, the design of the building and the process. And I, I, of course, I was digging into Alicia St. Leisure's um, very weighty account of the Royal Cork Yacht Club. Um, and I learned a great deal from that. But um, there was still some kind of um, confusion um, around the drawings and authorship and signatures and things like that. So, um, yeah, it raised a few questions. Um, the building is attributed to Anthony Salvin, who you'll hear more about later. Um, so I was kind of interested in um, his involvement and the relationship with the client and um, other architects, which you'll hear about later. Um, yeah, Sirius continues to care for the building. In 2018, essential waterproofing measures were undertaken in the former servants tunnel of the East Wing that you see here, um, an initiative supported by the Department of Culture, Heritage and Gaelic under the Structures at Risk Scheme. Um, in the second half of 2020, efforts to stabilise this East Wing, both inside and out, were carried out, including essential repointing um, with the support of the Community Heritage Grant Scheme from the Heritage Council, um, again in the same grant scheme. Um, and oh. And that's how, the, how it looks now. Um, so there's still a lot of more work to be done on the inside, but um, it was great to get a start on it. Um, so it was through the same scheme that this year we were set out to conserve, digitize, research, and disseminate the original architectural drawings from the building. Uh, the architectural drawings are in ink and watercolor on paper. Um, they're originally bound in a hard cover with marbling to the interior. Um, but they've been, they've been heavily handled and creased, um, obviously used in several successive um, phases of building and, and restoration um, over the years. 
And that's just some details of the damage. And there you can see very well handled and creased. So the grant um, thankfully allowed us to get Muckrus Conservation Book Bindery involved. And I'm just going to go through some of the work they did. Um, they disbound the volume, obviously, and um, relaxed and flattened all the drawings. Uh, they repaired the edges, spines, tears, and infilled um, all the holes. And all this was done with uh, Japanese toned repair papers. The collection had suffered a lot, um, as I said earlier, from handling and all the 18 uh, images needed to be surface cleaned with only some suitable um, for uh, washing um, after careful testing. So it's quite a frightening looking process, as you can imagine, um, but the, the, thankfully the um, Mokras know what they're doing. So um, these these are the drawings that could have been that could be immersed in ionized water and um, where the colors wouldn't run. Uh, the vast amount contain watercolor and um, so for those ones and um, they could only do dry uh, surface cleaning. The drawings were bound with a small amount of acid free tissue liners in order to protect the larger items and have everything laid flat. Uh, they're hinged on Irish linen and attached to acid-free heritage leaf guards. Uh, the folded guard section was hand sewn and then bound. Uh, the collection lies flat between mill boards and between acid-free end papers attached with Irish aero linen. The idea is that the binding can take any future abuse, but the collection is retained independently on linen hinges and can be accessed by in the future by a conservator if required. The cover is archival calfskin leather with spine corners and um, it's over elephant green acid free millboard. The boards are covered with handmade marble paper size providing a better quality copy of the original boards. And finally, they're housed in a phased box. So um, I was delighted to get a, a proper look at them the last couple of days. Um, Whereas previously they were so delicate and damaged, it was very difficult to actually get um, a nice flat view of the drawings. Now, thankfully, they're digitized and safely flattened. So, um, yeah, it was great to, to get a look at them. And um, I could only scrutinize them so far and glean so much. So, thankfully, the grant also afforded us the opportunity to commission Dr. Tom Spaulding to do some detective work about the design of the building and authorship around the building um, and the drawings. Um, Tom is a historian based in Cork City. He earned his PhD from the Technological University of Dublin and holds an MA from the Royal College of Art London. His books include A Guide to Cork's 20th Century Architecture, Layers, the Design, History and Meaning of Street Signage in Cork and Other Cities, and the Cork International Exhibitions 1902 to 1903 with Daniel Breen. And his practice as a freelancer includes work for local authorities, galleries and private enterprises. So without further delay, I'll hand over to Tom for the main event um, to find out what he found out. Over to you, Tom. Thank you very much. I'll just share my screen now. So if everyone be patient there for a moment. Uh, Brian, you can see the, the slide there and not the, uh, the notes. Um, yes, you'll have to go to the full slide view though. Okay, I'll just take that up. Okay, dokie. Uh, I'm seeing your note your notes slide now. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, how about now? Uh, is it misbehaving yeah. again? And uh, nope, I'm still seeing. 
Okay, how about now? Yeah, perfect. Great. Okay, sorry about that, Brian. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, <clears throat> so, hello, everyone. Um, before I start, I would like to thank the curator of the Serious Arts Centre, Miguel Amado, as well as Brian, for commissioning me to do the research upon which this talk is based. It'll draw on the published works of Peter Murray and Alicia St. Leisure, as well as Jill Alibone's biography of Anthony Salvin. Any errors of fact, however, are my own. The Sirius Arts Centre occupies a building originally built in the Italianate style, as Brian was saying, for the Royal Cork Yacht Club. It stands in the town of Cove on the south side of an island within an enclosed harbour east of Cork City. During this talk, I shall use both the names Sirius Arts Centre and RCOI Clubhouse to describe the same building. So please forgive me, but I'm talking about the same place. For those of you unfamiliar with the context of the building, marked here on the 1840 Ordnance Survey map with a red pin. Um, this is a map made before the building was started, by the way. Uh, it stands near the centre of the town, beside what is now John F. Kennedy Park, and what was in 1840 marked as the New Quay. The town of Cove has existed under a number of different names and spellings. And whilst the time, town's name changes over time don't exactly mark, match the stages of its development, they are indicative of its changing status. In 1750, the Cove of Cork was described as a village built under a high steep hill, the shore on all this side of the island being bold and the water of great depth. At the time, it was inhabited by seamen and revenue officers. However, substantial development occurred in the early 19th century. Cove's only road connection to the mainland was built in 1803, before which it was only accessible by ferry. In 1845, major improvements were planned by Lord Middleton, Lord Middleton, one of the town's proprietors. According to the Cork Examiner, these were to be conducted on plans prepared by that justly celebrated architect, Decimus Burton Esquire. The work, according to Mr. Burton's plans, will consist of an esplanade 2,000 feet in length, and they had in mind something running from the present place of the Sirius out towards White Point, about half the way. It also included a crescent and several ranges to be laid out for new buildings, with provision for terraces, hotels, baths, and all that con can contribute to comfort or convenience. In many instances, instead of a temporary retreat, it will become a permanent residence. Before and after the construction of the clubhouse, a new market house was built to the northeast of the one marked in yellow on the map, and a new square, currently called Casement Square, was laid out to the south. By 1862, there was a direct train to Cork with nationwide connections, as well as a road link. The town's Maritimes links, however, remained very, very important. The period from 1850 to 1900 was Cove's heyday, at least in terms of its civic development, what we could call the Anglo-American Atlantic culture of Queenstown, which focused on the Royal Navy and shipping, but also its growth as a place of recreation and recuperation. The construction of new schools and the new cathedral of St. Coleman from 1868 on reflected the growing power of the Catholic middle classes and clergy. This is the milieu of the development of the RCY clubhouse. There was an element of confusion at the time of construction as regards its design. A number of people were involved and each exerted their influence, although recent research has confirmed the design was Anthony Salvin's. There were various agendas and interests at play, which I'll attempt to briefly explain. But first, I'll talk through the people involved. James Hugh Smith Barry was a local landlord whose main Irish seat was Fota House nearby. He spent much of the year at his seat in Cheshire, returning in the summer to sail and see over his Irish estates. He was the Admiral of the RCYC for much of the middle of the 19th century and provided the site for the clubhouse. William Monzel Reeves was his estate agent and looked after much of his business while um, Smith Barry was abroad. Anthony Salvin has been mentioned in Brian's introduction. He was a leading English architect of the time and friendly with the Smith Barry family. John Benson was a Cork architect, who I'll turn to in a moment. Michael Cassidy 
a Cork-based building contractor, and Henry Hill, one of the large family of hills of um, East Cork in Cork City, um, was another Cork architect and the building superintendent. I'll speak briefly about Michael Cassidy first. Michael was a building contractor and lived on Cove Street um, off Barrack Street in Cork City. He was a contractor in quite a serious way. He was responsible for large parts of the Church of the Holy Trinity of Father Matthew Key, Father Matthew Key at the top of our image here, and for the construction of the Munster Agricultural Institute at the bottom. He also built the interior and roof of the Cork Opera House in 1853. Unfortunately for Michael, in 1861, he seems to have become insolvent and he seems to disappear from the historical record after this point. But before this time, he was a competent and hardworking builder. Cassidy's name appears on all of the drawings in the Sirius collection. Sir John Benson is better known than Cassidy. He was an engineer and architect born in County Sligo in 1812. He was a very busy man, as well as becoming Cork County Surveyor in 1846. He became the engineer for the Cork Harbour Commissioners in 1848, the Cork City Surveyor in 1851. He designed the National Exhibition Buildings in Dublin in 1853, for which he was knighted. And as well as all of this, he ran a private architectural and engineering practice. His work is familiar to many Corkonians and includes the Cork Bottom Market, 1849, the old opera house on which Michael Cassidy worked, the Cathedral of St. Mary in St. Anne, popularly called the North Chapel, and he worked privately for the Smith Barry family towards the end of his life, extending photo house for them. In general, he preferred to use a classical style for his secular buildings and the Gothic for his churches. The best known internationally, at least of the three, is Anthony Salvin. According to um, Alibone, Salvin's reputation had been established by careful, archaeologically correct work on old houses and churches. And his business was to a great extent based upon the patronage of the landed gentry and aristocracy. He was born into a, a minor gentry family himself in County Durham in 1799. He was responsible for numerous country houses in Britain, and these are two of his more notable commissions. He directed restorations and modifications to Windsor Castle, Alnwick Castle, which incidentally was a filming location for the Harry Potter films, and the Tower of London. He's largely responsible for the current appearance of the courtyards of the tower today. He also worked on restoring Norwich Cathedral and many parish churches. As could be seen from the previous slide, he tended to adopt an Elizabethan style on his domestic work um, and he also used the Gothic on his churches. Um, in terms of the military architecture, he tried to maintain and return buildings to what he believed to be their original condition. He was publicly identified at the time of construction with the design of the Queenstown um, Club. But due to the confused state of the design process, which I will go through in a moment, um, and the fact that he's not commonly associated with this style of design, whereas Benson was, and the previous lack of corroborating evidence in his own hand, and the fact that all the drawings in the serious collection are signed by Cassidy, there was some doubt, at least amongst myself and Brian's mind, about whether Salvin really was the author of this building. I'll now go through the timescale of the project and in building of the new clubhouse. The RCYC committee first approached the two local landlords Lord Middleton and Smith Barry in 1845, and both were very amenable to helping in whatever way they could. The following year, Mr. and Mrs. Salvin came to Cork and visited Smith Barry at his Fota house estate. They also traveled on to Killarney and to Mockross and made a tour of the southwest of Ireland. In 1849, Queen Victoria and Prince Albert visited, and we'll come back to that in a moment. What's striking, I suppose, from the modern perspective is all of these activities happened during the worst years of the Irish famine. And 
the truth of the matter is that for the wealthy or the middle class, life went on pretty much as it could, best it could during the period. The worst affected people were what we might call the underclass, and some people felt little sympathy for them. Before we rush to judgment, we might reflect on the disasters of our own time. When Victoria and Albert arrived in August 1849, the first port of call was Cove, or the Cove of Cork. A temporary building given the name of the Royal Pavilion was built on the quay a little to the east of where the present bandstand in Kennedy Park stands today. On the day of the visit, Her Majesty and the Prince landed and entered the pavilion. Having reached the interior, which was beautifully made up, the Queen stood in the centre of the apartment, apparently much gratified by the preparations for her reception. Although a handsome throne had been erected, Her Majesty remained standing, and at the request of the deputation of the town changed Cove to Queenstown. There was a sense of theatre to the proceedings. Another newspaper report reads, when Her Majesty arrived alongside the quay, a flag floated above the pavilion with the word Cove spelt upon it. And when she landed, this was replaced by the Royal Standard. But when she returned to her yacht, the standard was hauled down and a flag with a new name, Queenstown, took its place. After the worst ravages of the famine were over, the club felt that they might proceed with developments. In the summer of 1851, it was reported in The Builder that John Benson was building an extensive building containing a spacious ballroom, dining and retiring rooms. It was being erected under the direction at that time, but it's unclear if work actually started or where this report came from. It's very unlikely much work was done since Benson was still working on the plans 18 months later. However, no sooner were his plans complete, but there was a bombshell. Anthony Salvin had thrown his hat into the ring. Salvin proposed a new design to Smith Barry while staying with him in, in Cheshire, and the latter pushed strongly that this new design be adopted. Salvin may have seen um, Benson's plans during his visit with Smith Barry, um, but Smith Barry could also have described them to him. But to make his sketch, he must have known the size of the site, its aspect, and its as- access to the sea. It is possible that Anthony Salvin may have visited Cove in 1846 and therefore have been familiar with the area. With pressure being applied by the Admiral of the Royal Corp Yacht Club, who was also the landowner, Benson did the only thing he practically could do and withdrew from the process. Since Salvin was not going to return to Cork to supervise the work, Henry Hill was appointed superintendent and seems to have been responsible for some minor details of the building. There was also talk that Salvin's son, also Anthony, would act as clerk of works, but there's no evidence that this happened. Work started in May 1853, but as late as April 1854, um, it was reported that um, Benson was the architect of the job in Hunt's Yachting magazine. Somebody must have told Salvin or Smith Barry, and this was rapidly retracted and a groveling apology printed in the following edition. The clubhouse opened in May 1854. As regards the loss or gaining of commissions, something similar had happened to Salvin himself. He had won a competition to design a new home for the Carlton Gentlemen's Club in London in 1844, but was set aside after lobbying by an unsuccessful competitor. Perhaps all is fair in architecture and war. And this is the completed structure, looking somewhat like a holiday villa on the Italian lakes. The finished building differs in detail from the planned design. The biggest change was the substitution of smooth rendered rustication and coins instead of coarse masonry on the plinth and plasters to save money. The chimneys have subsequently been removed. On the drawings, it is possible to see the signature of the building contractor, Michael Cassidy. Also visible is the mark of W.M. Reeves per James H. Smith Barry. 
As I mentioned earlier, Reeves was Smith Barry's man of business during his long absences from Ireland. These signatures were something of a conundrum to myself and Brian. Could they conceivably indicate that Cassidy had a role in the design? Or is it more likely that the signatures were part of the approval process by which Cassidy signed up to the plans once his tender had been accepted? There is no name on the, any of the drawings of any member of the club committee, which seems to confirm St. Ledger's suggestion of the presence of the landlord's strong guiding hand behind the whole endeavor. The architect is dealing directly with the land agent. Evidence that clarifies the position is provided by this sketch in a collection of papers in the UK known to relate directly to Salvin, which makes it very likely he is the sole originator of the design, perhaps with some suggestions from Smith Barry. This drawing in the UK is very similar in all aspects to the ones currently held by the Sirius Art Centre, although the um, sketchiness of these suggests that they may be either preparatory design ideas or quick copies made for Salvin's office for the purpose of making a record. When the set of draw drawings held by the Sirius Art Centre were examined in August 2021 after they returned from conservation, it was possible to make out Anthony Salvin's embossed monogram on a number of the sheets, which seems to settle the issue of attribution beyond doubt. Benson must have maintained good relations with the club as he designed an extension to the building for them in 1866. A century later, the RCYC moved out of the building, as Brian has mentioned, and set up a new quarters in um, Crosshaven. In 1988, the Sirius Commemoration uh, Company Limited was founded, and in 1995, the Art Centre opened. And as Brian has mentioned or explained, the drawings have now been restored for posterity. Mention has made earlier in the talk about the clubhouse being in the Italianate style, and it's necessary here to talk a little about that and its life in, in Cove. The term Italianate is a little bit nebulous, since Italian architecture varies greatly, and the outcomes we call Italianate in Ireland, the UK, the US, and elsewhere offer different and uh, offer um, differ greatly amongst themselves. In addition, classical ideas about architecture, many coming from Italy had been influential in Ireland and Britain for two centuries beforehand. However, there are a number of characteristics that we can group together to try and define the style. There's a strongly classical influence, but with a lightness of touch. They often have symmetrical facades and a rusticated ground floor. Rustication is country style masonry deliberately left raw looking or with tool marks, suggesting it was roughly hewn from the living rock. Windows and door at the, sorry, beg your pardon, the above the ground floor, you want to offer fires light color plaster or smooth render. Windows and doorways are often surrounded by edicules, um, architraves modeled after a shrine with columns and a pediment. The building's coins in this case are prominent and they usually project from beyond the corners of the facade and are emphasized. Special attention is paid to the roof. It is either of a very low pitch or hidden by a parapet and a prominent cornice. It can be said, seen that Sirius R Center building includes almost all of these features, although the windows are round-headed and feature simple archivolt moldings. The style had been used by Desmus Burton and others in the 1820s and 30s and was later adopted by speculative developers. Montpellier Crescent is an early example for the south coast of England. Its form is inspired by the Royal Crescent at Bath in Somerset, built in the 1770s. We need to keep in mind here the relative ease at which well-heeled travellers, including the Queen, could move from the south coast of England to the south of Ireland by sea at this time, and we'll return to the idea of a crescent later. The construction of Queen Victoria's large and elaborate palace, Osborne House on the Isle of Wight, designed in part by her husband, Prince Albert, set an almost irresistible example. Just as we follow internet influencers and television celebrities, our ancestors copied aristocrats and royalty. According to the Oxford Dictionary of Architecture, following such a royal imprimatur, 
Italianate stucco ornament was widely used to enrich the facades of terrace houses in areas such as Kensington, London, from the mid-19th century, to which we can add other British and Irish towns such as Cove. Given the coastal location of Osborne, it is not coincidental that the style became popular for seaside locations. The Italianate style was also very popular in the US where it had arrived from Britain, probably traveling with passengers who passed through Cove. Why was it felt by Anthony Salvin and Smith Barry that the Italianate was suitable for the RCYC clubhouse? Firstly, there were the excellent links between the UK and US, which I've just mentioned, through which design ideas could spread. An 1830 prospectus for a proposed hotel and clubhouse speaks about Cove's proximity to one of the most rising commercial cities in Ireland. It's being the most direct point of communication between the country and the metropolis of England and the first outlet in the kingdom to every part of the world. Queenstown and its proprietors clearly felt that they ought to build a la mode, especially after the visit of the Queen. Secondly, there was a feeling that there was something of the continent about the Cork Town. It was stated in the mid-century, perhaps a little optimistically, that the climate has been found by comparison to be more equable and mild than that of any part of England or France, and to equal that of the south of Europe, even Rome and Naples. This idea continued into the 20th century, when it was named the Irish Riviera in a 1930s Irish government tourism film. Thirdly, the architectural concept of the town was the town, was the town planning efforts of Decimus Burton and the construction sponsored, sponsored by Smith Barry of the new market house for Queenstown designed by local architect, Alexander Dean. So what we're seeing here is a style being set and the RCYC clubhouse following what had already come before it, in this case, the market house. In as mentioned, Anthony Salford was extremely well known in his lifetime for his Elizabethan style country houses. So should we be surprised that he designed an Italianate villa style building? It'd be very hard to imagine a W. N. Pugin building such a thing, and debates about style in the 19th century were often vitriolic. But Salvin was more adaptable or versatile than some of his competitors. For example, Penoyer was built by, for a Welsh MP, and according to Alibone, it was clearly influenced by what Thomas Cubitt and Prince Albert had built at Osborne. As early as 1832, Salvin had designed an Italianate villa and got further similar commissions from this project. However, when he came to design a new house for James Smith Barry two years after the clubhouse was complete, the style chosen was French, emphasizing Salvin's lack of architectural dogma. In terms of the selection of the Italianate for the design of the new clubhouse, there also seems to have been a, an intention to keep the memory of the royal visit, in which the members of the RCYC were strongly involved, alive in the new building. The Royal Pavilion occupied an adjacent site and it shared some features with the clubhouse, namely its symmetrical design and classical form, that it was raised on a plinth, had a hipped roof, and most notably had a deep porch facing the harbour. In fact, there is evidence that the RCYC were wedded to Italianate architecture long before the Queen's visit. They'd previously built a splendid edifice in the Italian style, probably a temporary structure, near the Custom House Quay prior to 1837. It sheltered spectators at regattas and races and other celebrations, and was the focus of bands, concerts, and fireworks displays in the 1830s. So what is the legacy of the clubhouse? Clearly the most important, as far as the cultural life of the area goes, is the Serious Art Center, which has been running events for nearly 30 years. The artist residency program means that the building is still in domestic occupation. The events put on by the RCYC established a tradition for public entertainment that led to the erection of the ornate cast iron bandstand on the park that stands today and have their modern day counterparts in the summer swing concerts held in John F. Kennedy Park. Thirdly, the new clubhouse can also be said to have had an effect on the architecture of Cove more widely. With the famine behind it, Queenstown, I'm quoting here, 
was said to be looking up in 1855. The enterprising shipping firm of James Scott and Co were building almost a new town to the West End. In addition to the new square completed some time since, they have built a spacious hotel and are now erecting a row of large houses to the west of the hotel. Two years later, it was reported that from the harbour, the town looks very much improved and was lighted with gas for the first time on the 1st of January. The Crescent, first suggested by Decimus Burton in 1845, but built 20 years later, clearly owes, owes its form to Bath and design to Brighton. But the Italian influence on all of these buildings is quite clear. Even minor buildings, such as the Lodge of Carrick House, appear to be inspired by the clubhouse. This is particularly clear in the round-headed windows and circular recess in the gable wall. In particular, the RCY clubhouse, clubhouse set a template for detached quayside buildings in the town, which was followed in the design of Scott's emigration office, which is now the Titanic experience, the harbour commissioners, and even in recent years, the public toilets on Kennedy Park. These buildings all feature hipped roofs, very shallow sloped um, pitch on the roof, uh, square or squarish floor pans, uh, and most of them have round headed windows. So what started in the RCYC clubhouse seems to have spread across the esplanade and along the quays of the town. I suppose the Harbour Commissioner's Office differs somewhat because of its campanile type um, tower and clock. Having said that, in Cork City, one site finds a similar campanile and feature on these well-known model schools designed by James Higgin Owen and built in the 1860s. To conclude, it's clear now that Anthony Salvin is the architect of the RCY Clubhouse Serious Art Centre. The influence of Benson's design, which is said to date from 1851, is unknown. There is no evidence that it was built and there's no evidence of remaining drawings. So we may never know whether Salvin was inspired or influenced in any way and what issues that Smith Barry had with Benson's design that made him turn to Salvin to come up with something different. I believe that the art design of the RCYC clubhouse was influential locally and inspired details on a number of buildings in Cove up until the 20th century. There is one other factor which I would like to mention. I hope those better acquainted with Cove will forgive me for addressing it, and that is the impression visitors to the town might take away after spending some time there. The town of Queenstown lived and breathed the sea, be that for fishing, military or naval reasons, yachting and maritime celebrations, taking the waters or other recreation. It should be said that many of these events wore an orange complexion. However, as mentioned earlier, this joyful 19th century architecture activity and celebration was tinged with very, a very sad set of circumstances indeed. It is right and proper that the dark sides of the town's relationship with the sea, transportation, emigration, and drowning be commemorated. But it does mean that the experience of spending time there as a tourist is rather all of one note, and that note is blue. It is notable that for a port city, Cove is very unusual since it has no warehouses of any great size because the goods, in inverted commas, being imported and exported were people. Notwithstanding this, Cove is a lively place with an unsurpassed location. It has an architectural heritage that most towns its size in Ireland would give their eye teeth for. There are already efforts to draw the attention of locals and visitors to this, and there are plans afoot to make significant changes to its urban realm. Tomorrow happens to be the deadline for making submissions to these plans, and I suggest it would be appropriate to make sure that the town's Italian link and part of its Italian sunny disposition was part of the story of its future growth and development. Thank you for listening.